Well, good morning and welcome to Philosophy Live. My name is Christine Lambie. I'm one of the hosts of Philosophy Live here. And um, here we are mid-October. There might be a few things you might like to transcend. So it's definitely the time for a transcendentalist. So our subject today is Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's an American philosopher, and so we have an American guest speaker. Now, this is pre-recorded, otherwise it would be 3.30 in the morning for my interviewee. So we're ha happy to have here Barbara Soloway from New York, and she has loved Emerson over decades. She's taught him, she's given lectures on him, and she's spoken endlessly about him. So let me introduce Barbara. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Happy to be here. Great to have you. Thank you. Uh, let's jump straight in. Uh, tell us who was Emerson? America's great philosopher. He was a minister, a lecturer, essayist, an advocate of social reform. Those are some of the things he, you know, acted upon in his day. But most significant, he was America's conscience. He reminded us of what we needed to do and live up to. Considered a Hindu Yankee, I'll say a little more later, and uh, the sage of Concord. He was sought out by many people. And he generated in his time in the 1830s the movement called Transcendentalism, which was to remind all of us that we had a universal and infinite nature. So let's have a look at him. Here's an image. Um, would you like to just tell us something about that image? It's a beautiful one. He's young. Waldo, he liked to be called. He is upright. He has, he's full of grace and dignity and poise. And he's very attentive. And he's a good dresser. <laughs> And we've got that short quote there, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Is that typical of his attitude? Absolutely central to his whole philosophy. Enthusiasm means to be inspired, to be breathed into by higher thought, not our own usual stuff. So that day is great. That action is great when you are inspired. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And we can see his dates there as well. Okay, let me take that away. And we'll go back to this view. So you mentioned, you said a little bit about transcendentalism. Do you want to fill in a little bit more about what that means? The word itself means to go beyond anything that's ordinary and to be perpetually open to new insight, to always see fresh. He's constantly using that word new. <laughs> and... When you do, you start to trust where the wisdom is actually coming from, intuition, intuitive knowledge. And, and direct experience was uh, another extremely important point for him. You had to act. His motto is honor truth by use. So transcendentalism pointed to that, that it's more important than logic and book learning. And that any individual at any time can rise above their limitations socially and historically. So that kind of raises the question about his own life. Tell us something a little bit about his own life. How did he get on with that? A lot of tragedy in his life. Um, he came from seven generations of Unitarian ministers. So he felt pressure to become a minister, which he did, by the way. He also attended Harvard at 14 and started keeping his journal there, which was very important to him, these inspirations. Early on, he marries the love of his life, who dies tragically two years later. I don't think he ever got over that. He did remarry. He served as a minister for three years and then resigned. He felt that he needed a bigger pulpit to share his ideas, so he started a lecture, public lecturing for six decades of his life. His son also, a few years later, Waldo, at five years old, died of scarlet fever. So he was surrounded by a lot of death and tragedy, but he, his nature was to uh, overcome it. Yeah. 
So when he talks about transcendentalism, that that's a really heartfelt, given the the, the tragedy he suffered, isn't it? Absolutely true. <laughs> he would say his favorite thing: "Up again, old heart." You know, you feel it, you move it, and you, you move forward. Mm. Keep moving. So let's take a quote so we actually hear some of his words. Um, would you like to read this out to us? Sure. There is one mind common to all individual men. What Plato has thought, he may think. What a saint has felt, he may feel. What at any time has befallen any man, he can understand. Who have access to this universal mind is a party to all that is or can be done. For this is the only and sovereign agent. So that's beautifully expressed. Would you like to just summarize that for us to, you know, just reiterate what it's saying here? So in the view that he took of uh, infinite and universal nature, he strongly believed, as did the East, that, that there is one mind, that anyone can know anything, anyone can feel anything. So when we're in tune with that subtle knowledge, it, everyone has access to it. So the other aspects of the universal nature is one soul that's animating all men, it, and one will, that when we act in accordance with the divine will, we you know, harmony and justice follow. So these universals, which this is one of, is extremely important. And he teaches that all throughout his work. And men, we can presume now stands for men and women, of course. Absolutely. It's the yeah. mankind. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's take that away for now. Um, right. And... <clears throat> Let me just find my place. Yes. Yeah, so how did he come to this understanding? Who actually fed him his ideas? Who influenced Emerson? How did he come to where he was? Early on, he had an aunt, Aunt Mary Moody, uh, an, a pretty eccentric type person. But she taught him to rely on himself and to be courageous and to you know face the things he had to. And she was a little quirky herself. She was longing for death, so she would. She made her bed in the shape of a coffin and wore a burial shroud when she went out. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think it was a good way of, like, dealing with death for him because she was quirky about it. Yes, and death was much closer to people then, wasn't it? it was Unbelievable. Life in a way, yeah. As a matter of fact, he lost his father at eight and two of his younger brothers also. Mm. And I think there was Plato and some other influences on oh, him. Yes, without a doubt. At, so at 14, when he actually went to Harvard, which is young, he brought Plato with him, Thomas Taylor's translation. Yes. And it says, it's a beautiful thing. I read it in his journals that Socrates taught him the value of listening to his intuition. That was the first time he heard it. And he always did it his whole life. That, that was central to him. And then, of course, he wrote down what he, what he, what he heard. Um, then he found the Eastern philosophy, which transformed him altogether because it spoke to the essential and profound unity that I am in all. And he that resonated with him his entire life. He said he never stopped reading the East. Right. That's an interesting combination. So... Um, here we are, it's 2023. What what makes him relevant or interesting for us? How, how can we find value in his words today? Yes, and as we know, every the division that's all around us, um, he speaks to the voice of conscience and acting from there. What you know to be true, you need to follow and act on and make a difference that the individual actually gains their power from relying on that voice and that we we actually add to the welfare of humanity when we do so then we're in accord with higher law that's what needs to be done so that is really clear um the other thing about him as reading him he's as my husband says he's emotionally inspiring you feel him 
Uh, he's comforting, he's poetic, he's an optimist. He always looks for the good in everything. Doesn't mean he doesn't see the other, but he looks for the good. And so he reminds us to live large. That's a great phrase, live large, yes. Now, he also had a lot of influence on other people. Would you like to just say a little bit about who he influenced? It, very important people of his day. Mm -hmm. Number one, I'll start with Abraham Lincoln, the president, in the movement towards uh, you know, abolitionism. He was in his ear. Uh, Lincoln came to some of his lectures and eventually, you know, it, it came to pass. But when Lincoln was assassinated, it was Emerson that America wanted to hear from. He was their heart. And so he spoke at the funeral. It's a beautiful speech. You could look it up. The other extremely important um, person, his best friend, he considered Henry David Thoreau his best friend. And he was a, much more of an activist. So he wrote civil disobedience in his day. And that essay transformed the 20th century, being Mahatma Gandhi followed the ideals, and so did Dr. Martin Luther King in America, so that when there are unjust laws in society, it's our moral duty to change them. Mm. Mm. So he's a really important person behind these major social reformers, isn't he? Yes, uh, yes. yes. And I, I believe nature is one of the common themes in his work. Is that right? Would you like to say something about that? Absolutely. He wrote a beautiful essay. It's short. It's called, some of them are short, called Inspiration. And the first thing he talks about is the need to be in nature every day, to, to be immersed in the elements, the fresh air. Because as we know, when you're outside, you know, your thoughts flow freely. I find that it's very reflective and nurturing and that nature to him was the manifest form of the soul, of the spirit. So you see the law at work, you see beauty at work, and uh, it's really an important source of nourishment. And he was in tune with the romantics in England, they were very much in this, they were close, they were friends, and they also felt the importance of nature to the life of an individual. Interesting. Um, so you spent a lot of time studying Emerson. Uh, what has Emerson meant to you? What? Do, how, how has he changed your life? Uh, well, so much, it's hard to put it in one thing, as you know, but I would say this. When, when I heard what he said to Henry, that was the first thing when they first met. Spend some time every day in solitude and keep a journal. So the journal, I have kept a journal my entire life. And what that means to me is that I am much more in tune with what's coming to me, what's important, that I write it down and I reflect on it and I grow from it and I learn from, you know, the things that come and I value that time as he did. And everything that he did and wrote came from a spark from his journal. He developed it. So I know the value of that and I am totally grateful to him. And as uh, I just want to add that Anytime one of my students, uh, and they've been 40 years worth, would want to give me something, they would always buy me a little journal because <laughs> they knew how important it was. You keep it in your handbag? Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> and presumably it's journaling, not about things that annoy you, but things that inspire you or, or well, anything. Inside. Absolutely. No, not, no, that, that wouldn't be the real thing. He calls them, Christine visitations of truth and he didn't want to not remember them so you get an insight you know look we know ourselves better than anyone else you know we're living with whatever's coming uh he says in self-reliance the integrity of your own mind he teaches you to have that i like visitations of truth <laughs> them in a journal excellent um so if somebody is watching this now and they'd like to start reading Emerson, where would you suggest they begin? Self-reliance. 
key key essay. It will open up doors and everything that comes after that. Self reliance. And is there one book or one publication you'd recommend? The portable Emerson is always around. You know, it varies in what they put in it, but it's it, it has the major essays and his poetry, and it, it's very meaningful and beautiful. So when I teach, I have people uh, buy a copy or I Google them the essays. You can get anything online with Emerson. Yes, excellent. And I think you've got a course available online. Is that right? Yes, I do. I yeah. do. It's in, uh, it meets five times a uh, term in New York on Saturday mornings. I have people from France and England in the class and California and all over. So you're most welcome if you're interested because a group really helps bring him alive. Everyone says that. So you're most welcome. Uh, if you go on our website, uh, the School of Practical Philosophy and Meditation in New York, you will find it under Supplemental Courses, Emerson. And that's an online course, presumably. Yes, it's Zoom. Yeah. Definitely Zoom. Starting in January. Excellent. Yeah. I'm sure you'll get some new uh, uh, attendees from this. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, so give us a, one final thought from Emerson. All right. Not easy to do. <laughs> But this is from self-reliance. What I must do is all that concerns me, not what the people think. Perfect. Barbara, thank you so much. I, I really enjoy your enthusiasm, your expertise, and that New York spirit you're bringing to this. Thank you. For <laughs> you're very welcome. And good to be with you. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are not actually doing Philosophy Live next week because it's half term, but we will be back the week after. That's Friday, 3rd of November at 8.30 a.m. UK. If you've enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Facebook. And uh, I suppose I should close by saying have a great transcendent day.